Hello? So I guess you have um, obviously seen the topic. You probably saw some description, which is why you're here. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you. I hope this is an important topic for you, or an interesting topic anyway. It's a mixture between some patterns that I'm going to show and also some code, actually. It's mostly based on my personal experience, but it is about microservices and front ends. In this talk, I briefly want to give an introduction. This comes in two parts, one a shorter part where I'm explaining what this is all about, where it came from, why the need, and why am I even talking about this? And then in the second part, I'm going to show you five different patterns for micro front ends. What were they thinking? What were people thinking when they came up with this idea? This is probably very common to you. Many of you have seen something like this, right? This is a typical layered architecture with what people often call technology stacks. You usually get something, and they're drawn at the bottom with the databases. You know the drill, right? You get the DBAs, database administrators, or all sorts of other people dealing with some persistence, data storage, messaging. You oftentimes have different teams that are responsible for the back-end development, for the development on the server side, and you get front-end, which today, of course, splits in two major areas. One is the web that a lot of people, are, of course, are having applications in, and also native mobile. This split has been so dominant for so long in the industry, it's sometimes really hard to forget. I've even seen people talk about themselves to identify themselves. I've heard people say, I am a backend developer, it's as if it, they are, or I am a DBA. What happened, though, and you could have a whole talk about microservices here, what happened at some point, people realized while there were some efficiencies to be gained by having one team of DBAs deal with all the databases, the efficiency was not their core concern anymore. What they were most interested in was cycle time. They wanted to get out features very quickly. It was a competitive, or is, a competitive advantage to get features out quickly. And this structure doesn't really help. Your problem is, if you want to get a feature out, you have that team coordinate with that team, coordinate with that team, and so on. I've been working with organizations who are deploying into production several hundred times per week in a setup like that that is clearly completely impossible. So what did the industry do? Basically, they turned this on the side, and they said, we want to do something like this. We want to have vertically oriented functionality. We want to build microservices, and we want to have cross-functional teams that are responsible for them. These teams are often in the Amazon language, they talk about two pizza teams. They talk about these big American pizzas, and they're saying the team should not be larger than what you can feed with two pizzas, eight to 12 people, cross-functional. Obviously, to clear up a misconception, obviously not everybody in the team needs to be able to do everything, but the team as a whole should be able to do everything from interacting with the user to their persistent store. And when you're set up like this, you gain the two benefits that the original people, the original thinking behind microservices wanted to have. And that is, on the one hand, independent evolvability, the idea that I can evolve the service independently, I can make changes without having to coordinate with somebody else, which increases throughput and reduces cycle time. And the other one, not so relevant for us tonight, was this idea of the last rewrite, that you can actually say, I don't really have to write rewrite ever a big monolith, I don't ever have to say, I want exactly the same thing, but on a different technology stack. I don't know whether you've been on projects like that. They're usually quite painful. Then you hear words like ugly words, like feature parity and all these things. And you're just doing a huge amount of work just to go from one tech to another. Microservices and approach like that avoids that because you can start, you could imagine these colors mean different technologies. You could start changing your landscape. But that is, as I said, not the key thing for tonight. tonight I want to focus on the independent evolvability. Because what happened, unfortunately, is more like this picture. We've seen this quite a bit. If you think that gray line here is the limit between the client and the server, the web browser at the top, and the server side at the bottom, we saw lots of teams writing very nice microservices on the server side. And then they had one big application, if you will, one big piece of JavaScript that was consuming all those services. 
That is oftentimes known as the front-end monolith. There's a huge problem with this kind of system. You're getting all the inefficiencies, I should say, of microservices. You have to do all the work to now put a lot of different services into production. You have to have lots of different build pipelines. You have to have complete infrastructure automation. You have to find a really complicated solution for monitoring to aggregate all the data back. You have all the effort you have to do for microservices. But you don't gain any of the benefits because, again, you're not getting the independent evolvability because everything is in that big one front end monolith. Some part of the blue service is smeared across, the orange service is somewhere visible, and each time this team here, that middle team, wants to release that service, they again have to coordinate because they're still, in the end, working with the monolith. So this is worse than not having any microservices. Having microservices on the server and the monolith in the front end is the worst of all worlds, really. Unfortunately, that happened quite a bit. It was really unexpected. And I know many people who were there, I mean, I worked with ThoughtWorks in Europe, Many people who were there at the original days when we discussed microservices, when James Lewis worked at, um, at the GDS, the Government Digital Service in the UK, where they started building systems like that. And it came unexpected because we all had assumed that it was clear that we meant something like this. We really meant that the services had the user interface and would interact. That was something that didn't occur to us, but we saw it happen quite a bit. To the point, I know how many of you know this, ThoughtWorks publishes a document called the Technology Radar. We do this twice a year. And at some point in November 2016, when we were designing or we were creating the Technology Radar, we said, this is a major problem. 2016 already. The microservices paper came out early 2014. And rather than saying, don't do, my, um, don't do these um, front-end monolith, we thought, OK, we should be more constructive. We should tell people maybe, what else they could do. And then, reluctantly, we created a new term, front end, sorry, micro front end. It wasn't really necessary, we thought, because we had microservices envisioned to include the front end, but everybody, or not everybody, but many people didn't do it. So we said, never mind. The development community has spoken. Microservice is the thing on the server side. We need something on the front end. Let's do micro front ends. And that's what we stipulated in that edition. The situation changed even more as we noticed that a lot of the development effort that we were seeing was shifting from the server side to the client side. What we saw is, and this is, uh, was in volume 18, in whenever that came out, November 18, I think, we said one of the major themes of that radar was even that the browser is bulking up. There's more work in the browser. I've, I've personally been on projects where over 70% of the code is running in the web browser and only a small fraction is running on the server. And of course, if you then think back about the picture, then you have a handful of little microservices, truly micro mini services, but all everything else is really one big monolith and you are exactly where we were 10 years ago. So that really can't be it. So we thought, okay, micro front ends. What does it actually look like? How would you design or how would you build micro front ends? And over the years, given that we talked about this in November 2016, we had done it before, we have, as ThoughtWorks, we're not a small company anymore, we've explored different options in different contexts around the world, we started to realize that there were certain patterns. And these are the patterns I want to present to you in a certain order. I'm going to show you the most simple pattern first and then the most complex pattern last. That does not mean you should progress from one to the other. It just means there's five different ones, there might be further variations. I doubt there's something completely different. If there is, I'd love to hear about it, obviously. And sometimes one pattern is applicable. Sometimes you might want to use a combination depending on what you are actually building. The simple most pattern is the web approach. Basically, going from one page to another page. And all throughout, I'm using a hypothetical example of an e-commerce site where you can buy shoes. A lot of it, actually all of every, all the examples I show you are actually rooted in real examples. Sometimes I'll show you a little bit of code that is changed to protect the innocent. But I'm always putting it into that context. So what we are seeing here is we have service number one that is responsible for rendering what we call the article detail page. So that is a page where the customer on the e-commerce website can actually see details about the product and they can make up their mind 
whether that is the right product they want to buy. This will include a longer description of the article, probably some high resolution photography, maybe even like a 360 view and so on, like a lot of detail about the article. And then there's a second service that is doing the order capture. This is the service that actually, when you click on the put it in the shopping basket button, that then gets activated and does something else on the server side to remember that you as a user who is logged in actually wants to buy this pair of shoes. What is important to remember is that the idea of microservices was that they store their own data. So this service number one here will keep most of the information I talked about. Service number two will have to know a little bit about the products, maybe the price, for example. And it is totally normal in that case to duplicate this information, to have some data feeds that are asynchronous, that are feeding service one with all the detailed information, and service two probably only gets a small amount of details. I'm not really going to talk a lot about the backend architecture tonight. Actually, I'm not going to talk about it at all. I just wanted to highlight that. Assume that those services can act completely independently as far as the user requests go. And if you then think, oh my god, data duplication is actually totally fine, and in many ways it's actually the right thing to do. For example, if you're putting a pair of shoes in the shopping basket and the price changes, you generally don't want the user experience where you have to tell the user the price of the item in the basket has changed. I mean, if you put something on a wish list at, say, Amazon or so, and you keep it over there for a month, that will happen. But normally, actually, these services keep a copy anyway for a better user experience. But anyway, the most simple pattern is service one renders a complete HTML page. This could be a little, um, little JavaScript application that allows a bit more interactivity and renders the whole thing. When the user then clicks on a hyperlink to say, add this pair of shoes to my shopping basket, it goes to a different URL. The URL at some point, I'm not showing this here, is routed to a different service, and that service then renders it back and shows the shopping cart with, say, that new pair of shoes added to it and maybe other things that as a user I've placed in the shopping cart beforehand. If you can use that approach, it's the simplest approach. One of the reasons why the web works so well is because you have that nice abstractions, you have URLs and pages, and URLs can go anywhere. This is really easy to do. Unfortunately, in many cases, it's not sufficient because the users have higher expectations. For example, they might want to have something like this, and most e-commerce websites do this, actually. You actually have a little bit at the, bottom, at the top here where it says, you have so many items in your shopping basket or even maybe showing you the total price and so on. Again, assuming we have those two services, how would you deal with that? If you do server-side composition, that means you are rendering HTML on the server still, which is a common and valid approach, especially if you have a lot of traffic, if you have a lot of customers and, and visitors on your web page, it can make sense. You could do it like this. You do server-side composition. So service number one renders the HTML for the entire page. So when the URL comes in, there's a piece of software that decides this URL should be rendered by service number one because it is the article detail page. It renders HTML, which leaves conceptually a little gap here. And in the HTML code, it puts usually an include. This is a directive. I would recommend to use edge side includes. It's a little bit more standardized, but many of the servers can actually do also server side includes. ESI is just a standard and many of them support it. And this is actually correct syntax. So when service one renders the HTML, it includes this little bit here and says, at this spot, please include, include navigation, it should actually say shopping cart here. Please include that. And then you have Varnish or Nginx or something like that. While they stream the byte stream for the HTML page back, they pause briefly when they get across one of the ESI directives. They will then resolve this make a request to service two, that returns HTML, which they insert into the stream. When that is finished, they continue serving the data from service one, and the web browser sees one HTML page. Of course, you can easily see how you can expand this, and you can see how, when I copy-pasted this code together, I made a mistake. You can, of course, use that for navigation as well. You can have a, have a navigation here at the top, or for example, if you think about an e-commerce website again, on the front page, you usually have multiple different components coming from different backend services, like recommendations for you, or like a shopping, like a, what do you call it, like a, a set of images, like current offers, and so on, and so on. 
And you can do that very well when you do server-side rendering with edge side include. The key thing here is if you think about it, of course, once this is set up, the teams can work independently. Service two can completely change how they render the shopping basket, what they want to display, without ever having to talk to service one. The only coupling you get is, at some point service one needs to include, include the edge side include. They need to put that into your code. But I think that coupling is totally fine because you only do it once at the beginning. And in a way, you need to do it anyway because this page needs to somehow express the intent that they want to have the shopping cart, right? But after that, they can work on their own. I'm not going to go into complete detail here, but I want to show you this as an example of one of the myths. I've heard this many, many different times that people say, but, 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 if I use server-side rendering and server-side composition, I can't use caching. Or caching doesn't really work, and all my pages need to be cached, and if I do server-side include, then everything has to have the same time to live, and so on. So what is this is, this here is actually a little bit more from a debug version. This is the complete varnish configuration to allow you to do different time to lives for different caches. So you can see this at the top there in the VCL fetch function. You can see some basic um, matching. And it says, if the re request URL is for a page, then the time to then actually do edge side includes. And the TTL, you can see that here, the time to live is 30 seconds. So all those pages will be cached for 30 seconds. That's usually quite a long time if you talk about a high traffic website. If you get hundreds of requests per second, you're reducing the load on the servers that need to render the pages by a factor of over 1,000, obviously. Don't think about hours or so. 30 seconds is actually a long time when you need caching on a high traffic website. But what you say is, and oftentimes websites want to do that, they want to include some tracking so they can track with where which web user is going, which of course doesn't work when they get served um, cached pages. So what we're saying here is, if the request URL contains the, um, the path segment track, I'm saying, actually, no, please don't cache this ever. And here, this is just an example, a little trick. We're saying, if this is the URL, if it includes track, for the moment being, return a 999 status code that doesn't really exist. And then here, we can just do whatever we want. We can just insert anything into the response. So even though Varnish here is working as a reverse proxy, it is composing pieces from different websites together, from different services, HTML, one can be cached for 30 seconds. You could put five hours in there if you wanted to. But another piece not only can be not cached, but it can also be created dynamically for each individual request. There are other myths around server-side composition, but this is probably the most common one that says, oh, everything has to be together. What is a little bit more tricky, I'll be honest with you, is um, handling of the assets, style sheets and graphics and so on. If you have all these microservices, and they all render individual pieces of the HTML, they all need other resources, like, as I said, images and CSS. This is not a simple topic, and you have to at least spend some thought on it. A standard approach is to say for, C uh, for CSS, use something to do namespacing in the CSS so that every team can actually work separately. There will be some duplication. If on the odd day where your company really changes the corporate colors, you will probably have to do a synchronized release because you have the corporate color in multiple CSS files. I don't think that's a major problem. Oftentimes people say, oh, we have to have one sheet. It can only be in one place, but really try to make the trade-offs. Having it in multiple CSS files gives you the independent evolvability. If you deploy 500 times a week, that's the more important thing than actually having the corporate color only in one place because that only changes every few years normally. So. There are a nice number of approaches, but I had to make a call at some point. This is a talk by a colleague of mine that talks in detail how they did this at one client in Europe. The, uh, the QR code is just the URL. Um, there's a, a video recording of a talk where they describe in greater detail how they used Mod Page Suite, which is, of course, a module for Nginx, to do this in a different way, where they use Mod Page Suite to actually get together all the JavaScript and the CSS in a high performance way for a high traffic website to actually also get the benefits of the micro front end with the assets. 
I thought about trying to pull all of this in, but then we would have been here for two hours and not one hour. So I give you the QR code. So a quick, a quick detour. I want to talk a little bit more about independent evolvability because I haven't done that enough. This is a real example from a website that was doing classifieds for selling used cars. And the page looked roughly like this. You get the picture or multiple pictures of the car. You get a description. But on the website, it's also dealers who can sell used cars. And the case was that you wanted the contact information for the dealer on that page, let's say under the picture. Now imagine you are the team that is writing the classified page service, the team that is building this page. And you want the dealer information in there. You happen to know that there's this thing, the contacts detail service, another lovely microservice. And then you discover that they even have an HTTP endpoint and they can give you JSON documents. And for the dealer information, you can see this here. It says, is dealer true? And then it has a street, a house number, a city, and a postcode. This is a German address, and you can see things like the postcode is a number, for example. You see no quotation marks because I don't know what it's like in Singapore, but the postcodes here are numbers. So they see that. And then the blue team thinks, oh, we need to be independent. We don't have to talk to the yellow team. Fantastic. They have built a service. We can just call their service. And then they do that. And the code flow, in one way of describing it, looks roughly like this. The classified page service calls the contact detail service, gets this bit of JSON, and then renders it in the correct place into the page. And this is how addresses are formatted in Germany. You have the street name, the house number, the zip code, and the city. All well, right? The blue team is happy. They could implement it. They didn't have to bother the yellow team. Now the rollout continues throughout Europe, for example, and they go to the UK. Nothing different on the classified page. But our friends in the contact detail service, they start to have UK addresses. And then they return something like this. You get an address in London. You notice suddenly quotes appear around the postcode because in the UK the postcode have numbers. They didn't even know that that was happening. They consume that JSON, and they print this. Water Street 76 now because they were expecting a number, which it isn't anymore. And of course, if you know the UK, this is completely wrong. In the UK, the house number should be before the street name, and the postcode should be behind, after the city. So they thought they were doing the right thing, the blue team, but I don't think they really did, because they coupled themselves. And again, think about the idea of micro front ends. We said we wanted every service to own their own user interface. Here, the mistake was they didn't own the user interface. They provided data, not user interface. So a better approach would have been for the contact detail service to render a little bit of HTML. So they give me like two paragraphs. And of course, it's all semantic. I can format it as much as I want. The classified page does a server side include or an edge side include. And the address appears in the right spot. What happens if the UK gets into the fray? Nothing. Because they know what they're doing. They know how to render the address correctly. The classified page service doesn't have to do anything because they get the right document. Sorry, the right, rightly formatted address. So the idea really is you want to keep all that logic together in the service that should own it. They should own not only the managing of the contact details, but the user interface. So when they own the data, they can make changes and they don't have a dependency. Of course, that meant for the blue team, though, when they wanted to include it, they had to talk to them to say, hey, we discovered your JSON interface. Can you give us a user interface? And maybe they said, yeah, sure, there is one already. You missed it. Or they said, OK, we don't have a user interface. We'll write one for you. Or they are saying, ah, we don't have a user interface. We're super busy with something else. Couldn't you do this? And maybe you just, the blue team writes this, makes a pull request, and they accept it. That sounds like more work up front, but in the long term, you're really going with the original goals for each service to have their own user interface and for them to be able to evolve further independently. OK. Going back to the patterns, here's a third one, client-side composition. This is sometimes helpful when you have very, very high traffic websites that needs to have a little bit of dynamic content. I remember doing this for a project in the UK for a TV station. 
And of course, when that TV program was run, there was a huge amount of traffic on the website. Most of the website didn't need to change. It was just basic information. This could be pre-rendered. You could use a static site generator such as Jekyll to actually do all the rendering and create the fully created HTML pages. But they wanted to include a little bit about the user. Maybe the logged in username saying hello or you have messages or something like that. So one trick here is the service here would render the HTML but would also include some JavaScript. And the JavaScript could then asynchronously when it's running here connect to service two and retrieve some HTML. And it would know at which point to place the HTML in the DOM tree in the web browser. So again, they're completely independent. This service continues to, leave, uh, to deliver HTML fragments, but rather than being assembled with Nginx or Varnish or another reverse proxy, ultimately they're, in a, um, they're assembled, they're put together in the web browser. It's not a pattern so you see that much anymore, but it is still a useful one to remember. What is more common these days is the next pattern. And it's this one here. And that's client-side rendering. It's not only composing at the client side, but it's rendering at the client side. So it looks very similar. Service one, again, returns a lot of HTML and some JavaScript. But the JavaScript here knows I need data from somewhere else. But you don't really want to depend too much on the data, as we've seen can lead to big problems. So what they do is, they're actually fetching some JavaScript from the other service. That JavaScript is then run in here. And then that JavaScript knows what JSON data to get to actually then render the HTML on the server side. And this is an example actually from my own personal website, how simple something like that can look like. On that web page, I mean, I was really tired when running my own website of ev always having to deal with WordPress and all the security problems. And it doesn't change that often, to be honest. So I also switched to a static site generator, but I wanted to show people that I'm doing some work with open source software. And so I wanted to show an up-to-date view of when I committed something to GitHub. And I didn't want to regenerate the website every night or so. I wanted that to be up-to-date. So I, I used that approach. And what I'm doing here, as you can see in the top rows, I'm just um, creating a div and that has a name, of course. And it says loading. Hardly anybody sees it. Most of the time, the internet is fast enough. And then I'm loading a script from somewhere. And then here I'm just saying, just using jQuery still, this JavaScript function show repos. And this code is then going to GitHub, is consuming the API, is returning a JSON document. That JSON gets rendered. And down here it says target personal repos. And the rendered um, HTML that was rendered in the web browser is then being put in that place, which is why people don't generally see the loading. But now, the fifth and most complicated pattern, and I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this. We do want, or many times these days, we want to have single page applications. Oftentimes, they're nowadays also called PWAs, progressive web applications. It doesn't really matter for what we are talking about here, whether it's either one or the other, and what the real difference is between the two of them. But the idea really is, that in these systems, you generally don't do any rendering of HTML on the server. All the rendering is really done in the client. And the framework that I'm going to use for the example is React.js. But I'm sure it will work in the same way with Angular, which a lot of teams in ThoughtWorks also like, and probably also with Vue.js. So what's happening here? Like in a normal React application, or in many standard React applications, we're sending really only a tiny, tiny bit of HTML. You know, like, I don't know whether you've seen a React application. It is usually just like 10 lines, and it basically says, I'm a React application, load some JavaScript, boot strap code, and then all the other magic happens. All the data is actually being loaded from the server using JavaScript, and all the rendering happens in the browser. So what we are conceptually doing is, it's sending a little bit of HTML. The web browser then requests JavaScript, and that JavaScript can actually pull in some JSON to be rendered. If we want to compose this, what we need to do is, if we want to have it from the other service, think again about the shopping cart and the, 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 the shoes, it is pulling um, J, um, JavaScript from the other service, 
and that JavaScript, the JavaScript that was pulled from service two is then making a request to service two to actually get the data it needs to render HTML. What is so important about this one, it's only one tiny box away from the big anti-pattern. This is the front-end monolith, right? It looks almost the same. Look at the difference. This is terrible, and that's fantastic. <laughs> but you know why, right? Because here, I can maintain independent evolvability. If that service changes, if the data format changes, this team that is responsible for service two can also change the JavaScript to adapt to the different service and the different functionality. In this case, if they change the data, the JavaScript came from the other service, and they can't change it. So this is the good pattern. And I want to give you a brief explanation of how on one real project we actually built this using React.js. And I need a, a few minutes to do that, but we have some time. So at the top, you can see we are defining in the outermost, usually you have something that is sitting like a frame around that loads the further one. So if you go back here, usually you don't have service one, two, you usually have like some frame, the initial application that maybe shows is the user logged in or maybe doesn't show anything, it's just there to load the rest. And then you on, don't only have one more service, you usually have like three, four, five different services. So this is in the outermost frame, and it's, uh, it defines a JavaScript object called externals. So you can call it whatever you want. But this is just the things that are being pulled in from the outside. And we do have a little bit of coupling here. So we're saying we will have this card preview tile. Tile is just what we called it in that context. And it's a component, and there's a route, which is part of how React actually works. And then at the bottom, we need to export this, of course, for the rest of the JavaScript code to know about it. And here's one function that I will show you in more detail what it does. But it's only being called once the React application is initialized. It says, load all the other externals. And here it does it in two steps. It first loads a front-end config that I'll talk about in a minute. And with that front-end config, it then calls load the actual front-end. So it's a two-step process. It first gets a configuration, and then it loads the additional front-end. And that is an important point. So load front end config looks like this. It fetches, so let's assume this is the blue service still. It goes to an endpoint and, and says, get me the config resource. That is a little JSON document, and that basically contains a mapping from a known name, like shopping cart, to some resources. Usually, like most of the time, just the URL where to load the JavaScript and the CSS from could be a little bit more of information. But that's basically the idea. Yeah, and the rest, I don't know how much JavaScript you know, the rest is just boilerplate. You need to do something with authorization. And if it works, you're returning um, the response, that JSON. This is the return value here, and gets into the promise, and then load frontends will have the configuration. What is super cool about this approach is, if you're running this frame, you can configure where to load the other services from. And if you've ever worked on a large application that has like tens of services, and you're working on a normal laptop with 16 gigabytes of RAM, you can run into trouble. I've seen in ThoughtWorks developers say they need laptops with 32 gigabytes of memory because it really doesn't all fit into RAM. This approach makes it quite nice. Let's say you have like 10 different services. There's this framing service, and then you have like 10 different components. What you can do is you can run the frame on your machine, and you can configure the frame to say, load the service, the URL, the endpoint, for the service I'm currently working on. Load that from my machine. And the other eight services, you configure the URL to actually point to your continuous integration or to some other staging environment. And they will load the JavaScript from there. And the JavaScript will also contact a service running on there. So you can run the full application on your laptop. You have only the service that you need running on your laptop. Everything else you can pull in from somewhere else. You don't have the complexity of running all of this, of having to check out the source code, running all the front end pipelines. You can just point at something else, but you still get the experience of having a full website. It's quite an important benefit, I would say. What you do next is, 
and this is the second part here, we actually need to load the front end. And you can see here, as I mentioned, you get a bit of config back. We had here load front end config that gets passed in here. And you can see how in the config I'm looking up cart CSS. So this is where I need to load the style sheet from, as I mentioned. And this is just a naming convention. You could do whatever you want in there. And it loads the style sheet. I mean, I don't think I have to show you loading style sheets. It's very easily done in JavaScript. Now the interesting part is, in this config dictionary that came back from the endpoint here, I'm getting the card JavaScript, and that is a URL. And I'm loading this, and I'm passing a name to actually put it in the right place. Loading the script, we tried lots of different things. The easiest way, I'm not showing you the source code for this method here, for this function, but the easiest way we found is simply to create its script tag and put it into the DOM, which will make most modern browsers actually load the JavaScript. And then what it will do by loading them, you will have access to this exports to a variable that I'll show you in a minute that was exported by the JavaScript you loaded. And you can see again, we're using promises here. And then we're just pushing everything that was in the exports into the externals thing that we defined before. So now externals, the object we defined down here, has a reference to all the things that were defined in the JavaScript for the card, and they can make use of it. And then because I don't know how much you know about React and Redux, we actually use um, the store here, the Redux store, and we add a reducer that we can now get from the JavaScript we just loaded. So card.js included a reducer, we can take it here, because we've assigned it, and add it to the store. So the React application now is extended a little bit because it knows about the reducers in that case. What I'm not showing you in the store, to actually keep them separated, you can path prefix, you can put the state in nested objects in the store. So what we're saying, everything that the shopping cart wants to store is actually under the prefix cart. And if you have like the article detail page, so the ADP would be under ADP and so on. So again, the teams individually could work, they could store things in the React store, in the, in the store, in the web browser without actually treading on each other's toes and again could work completely independently. Of course, in theory, you can see some duplication here. You see card CSS, card JS, card, card and so on. And if you're loading 10 services, you might want to have another little function where you can just pass in the spring card and then you have created a convention and then you could extract that into a method. Or because you're only writing that on a two year project maybe once, you can just copy paste those four lines. It doesn't really matter. In the end, of course, you're chaining up all these promises that you're creating here with the load script. And then if you see, we're returning them here from the init one and then whatever the React application wants to do, it loads the JavaScript. I will admit this is slightly simplified because you do want to handle the case that maybe one of the servers under certain circumstances might not be available. And then maybe you want to be okay. If the shopping cart doesn't respond, you have a problem. People can't buy anything. But maybe the recommendation engine just doesn't work at the moment. Maybe you just gloss over it and ignore it. So there is sometimes a little bit more, like a couple more if statements, if you will. But in, in structure, it doesn't really change very much. What is important to remember is, at the top here, we're seeing some coupling. And what is coupled is, which of the components am I loading? And that's okay. If you're writing an e-commerce site, it is okay to at some point write down, yes, I will have a shopping cart. That's not much of a commitment, that's actually okay. You don't have to dynamically discover that you suddenly have shopping carts. It's okay, in my opinion, to couple this. What is decoupled is where to load the assets from. That already is giving you some benefits because it allows you to split your application onto this laptop server scenario. What is important here is also that it is also, I mean, User experience is most important. But what we have learned over the past few years, developer experience is also super important. And one thing that this solution offers that you can do is it allows you to do hot reloading. So if you think about how this works, in the end it just loads some JavaScript, but what you can do on your laptop is, because of the way React works, if I start having a front-end pipeline for this service number one or the card service, and I save the JavaScript source code, the web browser notices that and can refresh it in the same way you would do with a normal React application. That is quite different. I mean, an alternative approach that on purpose I'm not showing you in slides 
is another way of composition which involves the services building NPM packages. And then the build pipeline for something outer takes all the NPM packages, combines them. But that is a bad idea because you can't get the developer experience right. Because then for each package you, or for each component you're changing, you always have to trigger the pipeline for the thing that combines all the NPM packages. And that means immediately at a minimum you have a one minute turnaround time between changing your code and seeing it in the web browser. It's not a good user experience, sorry, not a good developer experience. And the code here at the bottom, there's nothing secret. Somebody could write a little JavaScript library for it. I'm sure somebody has at this stage. This is just very generic code. The fact that card appears here is just my laziness and trying to keep it a little bit more concise for you. So what we're seeing is there's some coupling, which I think is okay. The important thing where to load stuff from is decoupled and how to load something is completely generic. There's one more slide where I show you how that is actually then being used. So this is now again the frame where you can see in the top box how it is actually hooking this up in the routing mechanism in React. And what we can see here is we can now, because of the setup we have done previously, we can just say externals, which is that variable that was exported that has all the symbols. And we can say, just ask for the card, <coughs> just ask for the card service route, and we can add that under the route in React. And that works fine. And then in the second box, you can see how we can actually then use the React component. Again, there's nothing wrong. You can act, this is valid and correct um, React.js code. I can just say externals.card preview tile. <coughs> this is now the tile that was loaded from some completely random URL that I could configure. And it is going to be rendered at that place. What we often do is the, the service that responds to this API config, that is something that is often configured itself through environment variables. So when we deploy it, we can actually set this is where you can find the other thing. And then, oh yeah, to repeat this, so there's some coupling here again. I hear coupling is bad. I think it's actually okay here. Again, if you render the article detail page, it's actually okay to say, and I do want a shopping cart here. You need to express this somehow. So I think coupling the page that renders something to say, here the card preview tile, I think is a totally okay thing because you only do this once. Very briefly, this is now the other side. This is the shopping cart that is being included. And that's very simple. In components.js, you just basically say what you want to export, those JavaScript variables. And then in your um, front-end pipeline, I forget which one, this is, I think, Webpack 1, you basically have to say, I mean, it's unfortunate it's called exports here. Um, you're basically saying what you're trying to build. You're building app.js, which is where all the JavaScript gets into. And that was one thing that we fiddled with for a long time. There's different module formats, and I'm not a huge expert in JavaScript. That was the one that in the end worked, and we found this out by trial and error. So there's ES6 modules and a couple of other things. The UMD format was the one that was most easy to actually deal with when you're loading it, because that allows you in the easiest possible way to get access to the symbols you've defined. I'm sure there's variations. This is not the only approach, but I'm just showing you one approach to show you that it's actually not that hard. But that's all you need to do. And then when you're building, say, the shopping cart, the front-end pipeline is running all the time, you're changing a JavaScript file, it builds app.js, and then the hot loading kicks in, and the application actually sees the change in the frame, in the whole context. So these are basically, this is not coupling, really. I'm just defining on the side of the included bit what it is that I'm exporting. And the key thing to remember here is there is coupling, but the coupling is one-off. I add this once when I in introduce the new component. Whenever I make a change to any of the components, I don't have to touch any of this. Not, uh, it's not gonna work so nicely now, not what is on this page, on the previous page. I don't have to touch any of this. None of the teams that are working on the individual services has to go back to this bit, except you're adding a new component, but once you're working, you're completely independent. And similarly, you don't have to change that. And this one doesn't change either. So this is a one-time setup in the beginning, and after that, you have teams that can work independent of each other. They can deploy without the other teams knowing at all. I mean, you can have a pipeline, for example, into the production system that only builds the shopping cart. That is actually being pushed onto a new production server, a new instance, a new Docker container, in your Kubernetes cluster, whatever you want. 
And because the web browser from the user is making a request to the URL, it is actually loading the latest version for you. And that is basically all I wanted to say. So I'm happy to answer some more questions. I have a question burning in my mind right now. Mm -hmm. If you could go back to your used car dealership example. Oh, yeah. Right? It's going to be good fun I'm now. I'm very excited by what you have presented because it makes a lot of sense. Okay. But uh, this one? question over here. In the dealer details, you have rendered a few lines it has to do with layout. You have rendered a few line uh, image or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. two line object. Yes, yes. Right. What happens if you need to render four lines? Because certain countries are born with rendered, so you need to render four lines. I think it's part of the contract upfront. I don't know, it, it depends on the use case, I would say. It really depends on how flexible you design your UI. I mean, this is also a simplification because this presumes that you have a reasonably wide screen. There's probably some reactive, um, there's probably a version for mobiles where this is actually moving underneath. You don't have to use P's, you can also use spans and then leave it up to the consumer to say whether they want the spans underneath or they want next to each other. It really depends, but I know what you mean about yeah, the, the layout on the layout, yes, yeah. it depends. I think you probably have to deal with the fact that there's a minimum and maximum size or something like that. You, at some point you have to talk. So it's part of the design contract up front. So you've got to tell all your team your component has to be roughly this size. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends on how I mean it depends on how much variability you have. Is it going from one to ten? You probably have to talk. If it's two or three lines, you maybe don't have to talk. It's just an example, to be honest. So your render is not a generic render, it's a specific render for a specific No, element. rendering is done by the web browser, right? I mean, the web browser places all the elements. Yeah, but the HTML needs to render. Yes. It's uh, for a specific project. Possibly. It could be. It could be, but as I said, I mean, most of the time, and this is an example because most of the time addresses are written on top of each other. But as I said, if you are in a use case where you're saying, I don't know, we sometimes need them in a long line, you could probably rather than P's, use a different element and then ask the consuming side if you want them in lines, you need to make sure that they're positioned correctly. How have you solved this kind of issue? Has it come across them? It, yeah, as I said, it depends on the use case. This is just one example. In some examples, you can do it like that. In others, you can do it differently. Sometimes you also get, I mean, they might give you a long version or, I mean, not for an address, but for other things, you could have a long or short version and then you can pick which one you want. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question. What if you need to share data across different... Ah. Yeah. Okay, I'm slowly making my way through it. I should have stood in front of the laptop and pressed the right button. So the question is, what do you need to do if you need to share information between the services or especially in the web interface? I guess. This question always gets asked. I probably should add a slide. <laughs> to the presentation. We have, um, again, a number of different patterns. So one very robust pattern is to not do it. <laughs> I mean, you can always use something <coughs> like um, web sockets or so. I mean, for example, if you think about the shopping cart, this might not actually be the worst idea. You can also be in a situation where you have a call center and you're on the phone and the call center agent is saying, I'm taking, I'm putting something to your shopping basket, not a pair of shoes, but if you're booking flights or so. This could happen. So maybe the application that is running in the web browser needs to be prepared that the state is changing on the server anyway and be able to listen for an event. So what could happen then is that service one is sending a request to its service on the backend side. And that service has some asynchronous or otherwise communication with the other service. And that then pushes the change back to the user interface. So the two bits of JavaScript don't talk to each other at all. And I remember a case where we did exactly that because the application was built in such a way that service one was developed by one company and service two was developed by the other company. And the synchronization overhead and for reliability reasons was just too complicated. So we said we would only do asynchronous communication on the server side. But of course, as I said, the JavaScript needed to be capable of receiving through a web socket a change on the server side, and then it worked. There's two other ways, especially when you use React. One is you can actually use the store object that you have you can actually have a shared area there. There's nothing, it's just a convention again. You can put another, you can put a shared object in and then 
But that becomes a contract between the two ja pieces of JavaScript that they know there's something in the shared area. We've done this in one application where, yeah, the two JavaScript pieces needed to know a selected entity, something that was selected. And then we tried to have a minimum contract. So the only thing that was in shared was the ID of the entity that was shared. And if that changed, the service could then load its information about the ID from its own backend service. So let's say the blue service pushes a change and says the ID is now changed, and then the yellow service would see it and would say, oh, for this ID, get me my information. And that brings me to the third way. Also in React, what is very easy to do because you're sending these actions around. Oftentimes you don't notice it, but the actions really are only strings. Most of the time when you write idiomatic React code, you're using a variable name. That's how it's defined because you don't want to mistype it and so on. But in fact, it is only a string. So what you can do is you can use that as an eventing mechanism inside the web browser. So what you can do is the, the service one that is running here could say, I have now changed something. And then again, it becomes a contract what the name of the action is, but another service can register for that action and can do something based on that action. It is very tempting to always do that because it feels nice. The problem though is you're often getting back into this event hell that we try to get out of with React because of, I mean, the one-way binding made a lot of things much more sane. But if you now have one service sending an event that service two listens to and then service two does something and creates an event and then service three and four listen to it, you can quickly get back to a lot of the events. But these are basically ways of dealing with communication between the two of them, varying degrees of coupling. The important thing though is the moment you use either that store approach or you use the event, those do become contracts. And I got asked the question once, do you do contract testing on those? Ideally, you probably should. But when I've seen this, we didn't do it because it was actually quite complicated to do. I can't understand you very well. So you're saying if you want to avoid this, our WebSockets the only option? Yeah, I mean, so this could be a request that you have something that you have stopped doing, so and you want to avoid that completely. So uh, yeah. you would have to use the ID you need from WebSockets and the service you yeah. need. Yeah, WebSockets, because that means the server can initiate, of course, some transfer or some redisplay in the web browser. I mean, of course, instead of WebSockets, you can always use polling, but that's usually a bad idea for Yes, it would, of course. Sorry, without. Yeah, so yeah, if you use WebSockets, it scales better. If you don't use WebSockets, of course, it doesn't scale as well because you need to do polling. That makes sense. I have another question. Hmm? So it sounds like you're saying there's multiple calls to different services to get your data. Mm -hmm. to your, because this is like multiple IOs. Mm -hmm. Instead of like getting one from just one server, I get all my yeah. data from here. So would that be a performance issue? Because you're making multiple calls. Yeah, I think it's not too bad. I mean, with um, HTTP one, you can always use Keep Alive, so it's using one um, HTTP connection. It shouldn't make much of a difference, really. Mm. That's with all the service state on one server. Yes, but you generally want that anyway because you you don't want the user. I mean, if you use uh, an authentication solution, you don't want to have you don't want the user to log in into multiple different components, right? You generally want to have, in any case, I need to, needed to make the diagrams a little bit more abstract, but in any case, you generally have some reverse proxy in front that does the distribution to the different backend services. And you don't have to. I mean, the example from my personal website and GitHub shows you don't have to. But most of the time, you actually have that situation that there's a reverse proxy in between. And as I said, with Keep Alive, it's usually not such a big deal. And to be honest, the biggest thing is normally either the libraries or nowadays in the times of retina displays, actually the graphical assets and not so much the minified JavaScript that you have written yourself. Ah, good point. Yes, web components, I didn't mention them, right? And I also didn't mention one thing, I was wondering whether you noticed that. In that approach, you have to use the same version of React, basically, because the, the frame is loading the React library, and then it is loading all the individual JavaScripts. I think from a user experience perspective, that is the better approach. Web components, in theory, 
Yeah, I mean, they understand that they've been around for a very long time. Web components in theory would allow you even more independence. Each of the components could have their own framework. Honestly, I've not seen this in the wild. I've not seen anybody use web components for that. At ThoughtWorks, they're very curious about it, and we're in a lucky position that in some countries, including Germany, where I'm normally based, we work with um, universities, and we currently have one student writing a thesis about the idea of using web components for micro front ends. So that student is really trying to figure out how that would work and whether web components could indeed be a good solution for it. As I said, I've not seen it in the wild. But I briefly wanted to come back to the idea of using web components and the freedom it gives you. It would, in theory, give you the freedom to write, say, this piece in JavaScript in one version of React and that piece in a different version of React, giving you more independent evolvability. And that is important for the organization that is writing the software. But I think everything is less important than the experience for the user. And if you have eight services and they're running in web components and they each have the liberty to use a different version of React, then you would load React eight times. And that is probably not a fantastic idea. It's independent? Yeah, I understand. Yes, what? <coughs> yes, but for so it's promising this problem that you do not know what what is going to be next year to try to solve for your own yeah. and you know, because yeah. it's new. Yeah. So I think that components can be used for some kind of CSM. Yes. And I think loading CSS and JavaScript and everything can be used for some for some kind of CSM. So yes. I totally agree with you. Web components have a lot of promise, and they would solve some of those issues. At the moment, we often use workarounds, right? For the CSS, I forget what it's called. There's this module that mangles the names. I think it's called CSS modules, right? Yeah. yeah. And then a BEM is also another one, which is more like a convention of how to name your CSS so it doesn't collide with your. These are workarounds, and yes, it gives you Web components would give you better isolation. That's what I'm saying. I'm super excited about this um, thesis to see what are the benefits. But it is also, for me, an observation. I mean, I work with, as a consultant, we work with multiple companies. I've not seen anybody do this with web components. And I've always been pressing myself because I understand the benefits. But I, I want to see what stops people from doing it. Or maybe it's just because nobody has done it. But yeah, but I mean, it has been in its infancy for like, what, four years, five years? I mean, it should be supported. And now with even Microsoft switching to, um, to the new rendering engine, to Chromium, there's only like Firefox and Chromium left, or Safari is a slight variation. I think it should be possible to do it. We'll see, maybe if we talk in two years, you would do it. But I briefly, but I briefly wanted to come back to this idea of loading multiple versions of React, because just because you could, it's a bad idea. What we think, what I think we can do is we can learn in that case a little bit from the, the lot of work that companies like Google and Facebook have done around monorepos. I mean, they are doing a lot of this on the server side. I'm unconvinced. I've spoken to some people. I've even spoken to one of my old colleagues who ended up being at Facebook to write Buck, which is a special build tool to allow monorepos. So I'm unconvinced on the server side, but I think on, in the, on the web browser, it can actually probably make sense to learn some of that when you have to deal with it. And then, of course, what is also important to remember is there's a lot of security problems in the front-end side in the user interface. And if you use that approach and the first team that wants to switch to a new React application has to make sure the other teams work with that, can potentially be actually a good thing for your security. So server side. Uh, the last PR, I presume all client side. Yes. The server side ones are really good when you have really high traffic and you want search engine optimization, when you don't want to render something different. I mean, there are a ton of other approaches too, but generally when you have a big e-commerce website, I'm using e-commerce as an example here, it works for many other things too. You have a product catalog 
and you want the search engines to actually provide deep links, it's of course easier if you render HTML. And I don't know what happened to it. I think Google wanted to have a minimum JavaScript implementation to actually be able to render your pages for search. I'm not sure what came of that. There are all sorts of other ways. There are technologies, oh, what was it called again? There's one technology that actually allows you to have client-side rendered, but it basically uses a, the browser part on the server side to render the HTML on the server if a search engine comes your way. <laughs> so it's actually quite good for, for the fact. And of course, it actually creates minimum load. It is easy to cache. The browsers are, are simple to use. These ones are harder to program because you have to use more JavaScript. You have to do more testing in the browser. And it uh, gives you, of course, on the other hand, more interactivity. Yeah, this yeah. is interactivity, right? I mean, especially the applications we sometimes see that companies are writing for internal use. Oftentimes they're replacing applications that were written with Windows Forms or whatever the JavaScript, uh, the Java one was called SFX. No, I, I can't remember. Whatever these applications were, they're now being replaced and we're doing this, we're building uh, the application that all the dealers that Mercedes-Benz, that are selling Mercedes-Benz cars, both in China as well as in Germany, this is a React application. And that's very interactive, right? I mean, you can, there's all sorts of like, these like tile-like things and you can configure the car and so on. You could never do that with a static web page, right? I mean, just to scroll up and down and choose all the different trimmings and so on. That really feels like an application. For many reasons, they did not want to write native applications for mobile devices. It needs to work on a PC for the sales representatives as well as an iPad in the showroom. So a web application is the best way and that is often where we see the push. I mean, we've done this also for all sorts of applications. I mean, we did another one for a logistics part of a big, um, yeah, for a big company. And the drivers, when they drive around, they get all the route planning and so on. It's a React application. You couldn't do that with HTML, really. And at the same time, they still combine multiple things, and then you can use an approach like this. Oh, oh, oh it's quick now. <laughs> I'm going to start from the right, so you can. Okay. So you just configure what you have to load uh, from your side, like UI or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure I understood. You mentioned NPM. Are you saying you want to do create an NPM package? Uh, no, Angular, we can, uh, we can create our own uh, packages. Like UI components, oh. we can submit to NPM. It can be used across the team. Okay. So for example, you can create a timer component or any okay. basic uh, pay, uh, kind of any okay. page, something text is any any okay. UI functionality kind of stuff. Okay. You create a component with a net GPS JS. I understand. So I, yeah. it's like it's like it's like so you have different components you have to load. Instead yeah. of doing a you're also referring to some kind of tag. In that tag mm. you are telling what JS you have to load. Then mm. JS will load that U plus uh, controller part and it is doing that part. Okay. So already I am thinking it is similar to okay. the Angular uh, way of doing it. Okay. I'm not familiar enough with Angular to really comment on it. The one thing I would wonder is if you change the component can you hot reload that in the browser? Or do you have to build the NPM package again? Yeah, it depends upon the which version of your component you use. You, you, in the configuration section, for that component, uh, what is the version you add as a dependency? If you're adding a kind of version 1.0 component yeah. of that uh, package, it loads up that UI plus that, uh, that, con uh, that controller. If and you when, update yeah. that thing, then only it will do that. Okay. And I'm not 100% way if you can. Okay, I understand. Okay. Maybe it's a dynamic loading of the component. Yes. Adding the U plus controller part of a different uh, application or a different uh, use. Yes, that was what I meant with developer experience, that you don't want to have to rebuild anything that when you're working on the components. Yeah. I'm sure, I mean, I've seen component libraries as well. If it's small things like buttons and so on, that can make a lot of sense. You can also share those in a, with storybook or so. But yeah, I don't know. As I said, I'm not a big Angular expert, so I don't know.
the most, again, it depends. I mean, what do you get? Do you have any numbers? The, yeah. The, the most common way of doing this today that I'm seeing is that you use some form of um, SSO. So w no matter where you go, it will check whether there's a cookie. And if you don't have a cookie, normally a JWT token, if you don't have it, it will bounce you to an SSO server. There you log in, that bounces you back, that uh, takes apart the whole thing, issues a JWT token, and then the user can continue. Now that begs the question, of course, if I go to, say, the article detail page here, this needs to understand the JWT token. But then I go somewhere else to the page, in this example here, to the shopping page. That also needs to understand the JWT token. And suddenly you find yourself that each and every service has to understand the JWT token format. And you can't take that lightly. You can't just decrypt it. You also need to check the signature. Because otherwise, of course, anybody on the internet could say, I'm an admin, here's my token. <laughs> so then you find yourself having the need in both of these services, and potentially all of the services, to add the code for analyzing the JWT tokens, which you really, really don't want to do. In my opinion, a bad approach, but better than nothing, is to create a shared library. But shared libraries are usually fraught with problems because then you write them in Java and somebody else is using even just like Kotlin, although it's on the JVM, but maybe they write it in a different programming language and then the library doesn't work or somebody forgets to update it and so on and so on. So it's not a great idea. Shared libraries are generally, I would say, discouraged. You shouldn't do that. One option that I've seen being used quite a lot is to integrate that into the reverse proxy, which you inevitably have. And for example, in Nginx, one thing that I worked on recently, we wrote a lot of the backend stuff in Clojure anyway, and Nginx can be extended with Clojure. And we wrote a little bit of code in Nginx that takes apart the JWT token, makes all the necessary checks, and then adds that as HTTP headers onto the downstream services. So the request comes in, Nginx takes apart the JWT token, verifies the signature, and then puts username and some entitlements and so on as normal HTTP headers. And the services behind here, they can believe it now because they know somebody else checked the JWT token further down. And of course, the most, I don't know, the most fashionable and hip way is of course to use service mesh. When you are using a service mesh, then it becomes very easy because you have a sidecar and you can put all of these things in the sidecar. You know the idea, right? I mean, you have in Kubernetes, you have the pods and you have the, your service is running next to something else that is delivered by the service mesh and then the service mesh can deal with it. But now you introduce a layer dependency. You are into a layer dependency. You're degrading to a layer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is, yeah, where does the layering start? Is it still platform? Yeah. I know. It is, I mean, in many ways though it is separation of concerns that gives you more flexibility. I mean, separation of concerns you already get with the Nginx because then the concern of actually verifying the authenticity of the JWT token is separated from the services. So you have a thin authentication validation. Yes, layer. yeah, you, there, there's many different, that's what I said, there's many different ways, but these are the most common ones. Shared library, not a great fan, reverse proxy, or then sidecars for authentication. Wait, I want to, there was one more. Mm -hmm. And all these three services need to read the JWT token, which is already present in the browser, mm -hmm. and then it needs to understand who the user is. So that will be a common port that all the services that offer access to the authenticator of the API. Mm. Right. So okay. if I have a port, uh, I need to have a port to validate the token, or I need to have check the token if the token is already present, because if the user is already authenticated, I have a problem. So where will I like this? That's what I mean. You can have a shared library that does this, okay. and that is linked or embedded into all the services. Or, because even in that example, in all these examples, maybe it can only get so much onto a diagram, it is always going normally through a reverse proxy, and you can put it into the reverse proxy before it actually ever hits the service. Okay. Conceptually, it's a logical limit. You call yeah. it to this layer, yeah. please authenticate me. Yeah. Yeah. And the layer takes the attention. And, and then the, the service doesn't need to, it can just read an HTTP header. And the header is called user ID. And whatever's in there, the service can believe because it knows that somebody else has checked this beforehand. So uh, how about a custom, uh, actually you got a custom component I have, which is like uh, a component, so I have a drop-down component called customize. It can be reading your 
Maybe I should say that that is not an approach, and this may be coming back to the Angular question also, this is not an approach to do components like a drop-down list or a date picker or a button. This is an approach for microservices. Microservices, these services should be business-relevant components. I mean, if you look at the definition, or not definition, the description that Martin and James wrote about microservices, they, they wrote down like eight different characteristics, and one was a microservice should really represent a business capability. A date picker or a drop down is not a business capability. So this is really more for integrating chunkier bits. Not on the HTML side, it's on most of the services uh, where you try to do CS, those kind of uh, JavaScript libraries you'll be loading. Okay. You'll be loading your the, you'll be loading JavaScript code that you have developed, your teams have developed. That's what this is about. Mm, yeah. Um, now this, the other front end also needs to access its own code, right? Mm -hmm. How do we pass the token from the token that we have received as part of the authentication? <coughs> do we pretend that when the second micro mm -hmm. front end tries to access its own service, we don't want the yeah. authentication to happen? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Most of the time, when you do this, you do want to have a reverse proxy in front. And they are running on the same domain. So they all get the JWT token, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, from the front end itself, when you pass the API, it needs to send the token along the new process. Yes. Right? So how does the second front end get the token to be passed? It can get it from the web browser. It is running in, this on the, same, in the same context, right? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that cookie, I know what you mean, I mean that, but that cookie is accessible to the JavaScript code, right? It's going to be sent anyway. I mean, if you, if you take the example that I gave with, say, this one here, and that's running on a different domain, you have a problem. Then you would probably behind the scenes see this um, dance one. But as long as you do something like this or in such an example, you would generally have a reverse proxy here, then they all go into the same domain, and whether you get some HTML or some JavaScript or some, some um, JSON document, you can always include the JWT token, or it is always included, it is taken apart by the reverse proxy, and the services then have the information they need. Yeah, that's what happens to that when we get to the backend? Does the backend second second resolution? It there's no good answer for it. It really depends. I mean, sometimes you need a backend for front end, depending on bandwidth requirements, depending on how many different devices you have with very different use cases. If you are SoundCloud or Netflix or somebody like this that is in like smart watches and speakers all the way to TVs and PCs, you might need a backend for front end. Sometimes you don't, I don't know. How would you handle navigation? Oh, sorry, I was just. Ah, good that you asked, yeah. I mean, I mean like it's following the same logic, Yeah, I know. So native mobile applications, and because if you will, native mobile applications are also a front-end monolith, right? Yeah. And here, it's really tough to say. I mean, I've not seen very many people try this. There is um, made available as open source software by one of the big Chinese companies. I think it's Alibaba, but I'm not 100% sure. There's a set of, um, oh, yeah, there's for iOS and Android, open source software that allows you to modularize 
an iOS or mobile application. I, thought, I think one was called Beehive, but I'm not 100% sure. It's a bit like OSGI on the Java side, so you can load things. I don't know. The problem, I think, here is, again, the um, user experience, but also the developer experience. The native applications always get installed, I mean, with some exceptions in the enterprise space, I understand that, but they generally get deployed through an app store. And you don't have the same deployment frequency for mobile applications anyway. You're not doing 500 releases per week. You have to find a different way to make it manageable. You can automate most of the app store processes, but at some point, even if you could, and you could deploy once every couple of hours, you don't want to do it because your users will completely hate you for it, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I don't like them at all. I mean, we've actually, in, in, on the ThoughtWorks technology radar, in the current edition, we've specifically put release trains as a technique to avoid in general. But I think for mobile applications, that is probably the right way to actually come up with some release train and then do it once a week. And at that point, you probably don't need that anymore. You you can assemble it on the server side. It's not ideal, I know, and some of the benefits I talked about from a deployment perspective, sorry, from a development perspective, you don't get, but they're really not made for this. I think the frameworks, I don't know anything about Android development, I know a bit about iOS development. At least there, you can have separate pieces like the um, storyboards and the XIP files, you can make them separate, but then you still need one build to put them together. But as I said, in the end, you cannot, can't really deploy in the same way as you can do on the web. I'm not sure what will happen. I mean, Google really tried to push hard on progressive web applications. I mean, I use an iPhone, so I know that Apple really doesn't like them very much. <laughs> I don't know how many of you know this, but I think Starbucks is an example of an application that can actually be pinned to the home screen, but Apple really doesn't make it easy. There is a way you can, I think on the website, if you go to share, and then like further down in the gray section, you can say pin to home screen or so. They really don't want you to do it, but of course, for many organizations that want to deploy rapidly and want to have these cycles, it would be much, much easier to use web technology. But yeah, with the, with the applications, as long as they go through the App Store, it's really tough. If, you, if that's your problem, if you have a big application, I mean, I also know like some of the larger organizations, they talk a lot about application portfolios, and there's always this thing, should they have one massive application? Like if you think about WeChat, that does everything from chatting to payment to something else. Or like, I mean, if you take a typical airline, you have one application to, um, to check in and book flights, another one to check your mileage account, and a third one for the in-flight entertainment. So you have multiple applications, and then you're split even more. But if you really want to put everything in one, I guess there are the open source frameworks you could explore, but I've not seen them used in practice. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? Yeah, okay. navigation to me is a component like this. There should be a service. And that's what I've seen, especially here on that approach on websites, that the navigation is one top level thing that is included, and there's one specific service that is responsible. Yeah. Yes, that exactly. Thing. Yeah. And would decide which goes where, maybe even for different customer segments. You can run A B tests by, by swapping around things, by checking different so ways. The navigation service. Yeah, the idea really is that they try to use the same version. And that's what I meant. I mean, we have to learn really from what people did with monorepos on the server side and find a way for them to share the same version. It's really difficult to get this to work without web components for them to have different versions. And I totally get that it limits the independent evolvability because yeah. you now have to coordinate. You have to die one death, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> Because I mean, the other thing, I mean, if everybody, I mean, if you look at the current JavaScript applications, you often have so many libraries, you don't really want, if you have, and it's not uncommon, you have like 10 different services, if they all use their own version of React and the own version of Redux, one of them uses Immutable JS, the other one uses Image.js, and it's just adding and adding and adding, and then you're suddenly loading, I don't know, 10, 20 megabytes <laughs> of just JavaScript code, 
which is a really bad impression on first load for the users that first come to your website because then even if you use strong caching, they don't really have it cached, they download the whole thing, doesn't look very good. So, I don't know, it's not a great answer. As I said, I mean, the best approach that I've seen so far is to try to, to ar arrange between the teams, but then, yeah, of course, if a new version of React comes out, if you want to switch, you have a coordination problem. Yes. Yeah. As I said, the hierarchy is the user first and then the developer, and then the architect. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not architect, you're dog. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you. Thanks for coming, fantastic questions. <laughs> thank you.